Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alamin wassalatu wassalamu ala asyrafil anbiya'i wal mursalin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Rabbi syrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wahlul 'uqdatam min lisani yafqahu qawli. Rabbi zidni 'ilma, rabbi yassir wa la tu'sir wa tammim bil khair. Allahumma la sahla illa ma ja'altahu sahla wa anta taj'alul hazna idha shi'ta sahla. اللهم إني ضعيف فقو في رضاك ضعفي وخذ إلى الخير بناصيتي وجعل الإسلام منتهى رضايا اللهم إني ضعيف فقوني وذليل فأعزني وفقير فأغنني وارزقني يم بربحيا بروفيسور داتو إنجينير دكتور واحد بن أمة فايس تانسلر يونيفرستي تكنولوجي ملاشيا يم بروسها بروفيسور إنجينير دكتور زينودين بن عبد المنان Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic and Internationalization University Technology Malaysia members of the Senate all academic and support staff UTM welcome to our 100th UTM professorial inaugural lecture my name is Muhammad Rafiq and I am the Dean of Engineering University Technology Malaysia and will be your host today a bit about our program today The professorial inaugural lecture program is a traditional program that we have uh, for UTM uh, for those academic staff that has been promoted to full professorship to give a lecture to the audience. Mostly, previously, all our 99 uh, professorial inaugural lectures are held were held in UTM uh, in the Senate Hall. But today is unique. Today is special because. Uh, we have the inaugural lecture live, telecast, telecast live from the Facebook of Faculty of Engineering UTM. And today we have Professor Dr. Nordin bin Yahya to give his professorial inaugural lecture. In order to introduce Professor Dr. Nordin bin Yahya, I call upon Professor Dr. Azlan bin Abdurrahman to uh, read the biography of our speaker, Prof. Azlan. Thank you, Prof. Dr. Rafiq, for the introduction. Assalamu alaikum and a very good day, ladies and gentlemen. The UTM 100th Professorial Inaugural Lecture today will be addressing the research subject matter related to the oil and gas industry and more specifically referring to the advancements in inspection and integrity management of one key critical component of the entire oil and gas supply chain, the pipelines. The oil and gas pipeline infrastructure network and facilities is a multi-billion ringgit project nationwide. The big size of capital investment put into these projects and the sheer size and extent of this pipeline infrastructure certainly warrant a serious and focused attention on the effective pipeline integrity management to ensure public safety and, and environmental protection. This indeed will be the key focus of today's professorial lecture. It is therefore a great honor for me to introduce the speaker for this auspicious professorial lecture. He is a colleague of mine and one of the nation's leading research experts in this area, Professor Dr. Nordin Yahya. Prof. Nordin is currently the director of for Higher Education Leadership Academy, or ACAPT, at the Ministry of Higher Education Malaysia, in charge of developing higher education leaders through leadership advancement initiatives for national and international needs. Previously, he was the Pro Vice Chancellor International at University of Technology Malaysia, UTM, where he was responsible for planning and executing the internationalization policies and initiatives, as well as global reputation agenda for UTM. He is, he is also currently a member of Board of Governors for Tunku Abdul Rahman University College, the Vice President for GE4 Network, and International Advisory Board for MIT University, India. Among other portfolios he previously held include the Advisory Board of Swiss ASEAN Learning and Teaching Network, the Operational Board of World Technological Universities Network, Board Member of APAI, and the Chairman of Executive Committee 
for Asia Technological University Network or ATU Net. Prof Nordin graduated with BE Honours in Civil Engineering from Sol Salford University in 1988, Masters in Offshore Engineering from Cranfield University in 1992, and PhD in Civil and Offshore Engineering from Harriet Watt University in 1999. He has been with UTM for more than 30 years and has performed several senior administrative responsibilities including Senior Director for UTM International Affairs, Dean of School of Graduate Studies, Senate Member, Deputy Director for University Marketing, Manager of International Students Affairs, Deputy Dean and Head of Department at UTM. In this area of expertise in structural integrity, he is working very closely with oil and gas industry, particularly in pipeline integrity and risk management. With that brief introduction, I now invite Prof. Nodin to take the stage to deliver his professorial lecture entitled Advancements in Inspection and Risk-Based Oil and Gas Pipeline Integrity Management. Please welcome Prof. Nodin Yahya. Thank you, Professor Azlan. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh dan salam sejahtera. Yang berbahagia Baik Chancellor Universiti Teknologi Malaysia Profesor Datuk Dr. Wahid Omar, timbalan-timbalan Naib Chancellor, pegawai-pegawai pengurusan kanan UTM, Dekan Fakulti Kejuteraan, rakan-rakan hadirin sekalian. Thank you for accepting our invitation to be at this gracious occasion of 100th UTM professorial inaugural lecture today with me. Thank you, Dato VC, senior management, colleagues, friends, and family members, and everyone whenever you are, either in UTM, Johor Bahru, or Kuala Lumpur, or in ACAP, or anywhere else in Malaysia. We have friends joining from industry and other countries as well. Thank you for your support. I really appreciate because of your support gives me strength to stand here today. Thank you for the welcoming remark by Professor Datuk Muhammad Rafiq Abdul Kadir, the Dean of UTM Faculty of Engineering. And thank you also for generous introduction by Professor Dr. Azlam Durrahman, whom I regard as my mentor on my humble bio. I would like to take this opportunity to extend my appreciation to the top management of UTM over the years since the beginning of my service 32 years ago until now for giving me the opportunity to impart my knowledge to UTM students particularly, contribute to UTM community and industry as well as to the world community. Thank you for trusting me by giving several management responsibilities from being the head of department at the Faculty of Civil Engineering in 1999. I remember it was about six months after I've completed my PhD until my last position as the Pro VC International in 2019. And later Utah, UTM allowed me for second month stint to the Ministry of Higher Education as the director of ACAP. As for majority of us, it was really a big struggle for me to sustain my teaching and research work as at the same time being in administration almost continuously for the past 20 years. Before I proceed to the actual content of my presentation today, please allow me a few more moments to record my deep appreciation to all my mentors over the years. Uh, some of the photos are shown here, but probably some are not. I'm, I apologize. Uh, there are many others who have contributed one way or the other towards my personal development as an academia and as a person. Without their mentorship and guidance, it was impossible for me to reach at where I am now. Thank you. May Allah reward all your uh, contribution. I also would like to thank my research group members and students in RESA research group, 
Reliability Engineering and Safety Assessment Research Group that I established and lead since 2006. Thank you, Professor Dr. Hazilan Momano, who succeeded me as the head last year. He recently was promoted as a full professor at UPM. Congratulations, Dr. Uh, Professor Dr. Hazilan. We are all proud of you. These are some, uh, just a summary of our humble achievements as a small research group. We started with uh, just with just two PIs, Professor Mohazilan and myself, and remain so probably for almost 13 years. Now we have six members and five associate members from other universities. But Alhamdulillah, although we are small and achieve relatively small accomplishment, but I'm proud to showcase some of our success here. We have produced 14 graduate, PhD graduates, 13 master students, managed to gather about 16.25 million ringgit total research grant, and have produced 132 articles in Scopus and Web of Science. We have produced 22 IPs, one spin-off company, 7.55 million worth of consultancy work, and 8 million ringgit of international grant. Despite of being an relatively active uh, research group, my actual role and contribution in UTM is mainly in the area within my administrative responsibilities, as narrated by Professor Azlan. Uh, you can see here that I have been invited to more than 100 events as keynote speaker or guest speaker or invited speaker in in conferences, seminars, workshops, and meetings in more than 30 countries throughout the world. Most of them actually in the area of internationalization and university rankings uh, and promoting UTM to bring international students to, to UTM. I would like to say here that my involvement most of the time have been for UTM branding, global visibility, and hopefully somehow have contributed to UTM Global University Ranking position. Speaking about global branding and visibility, I'm thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and all the supporting members at UTM, especially at UTM International. Uh, we have successfully pulled off one of the biggest non-medical academic conferences ever organized in Malaysia, the 14th Asia Pacific Association for Internal, International Education Conference and Exhibition, APAI 2019, which have attracted 2,500 delegates from 60 countries and about 1,000 institutions. It was a very, very big branding for UTM in front of the world stage. Uh, the total revenue of the conference was about 11 million ringgit and have contributed some part of it to UTM coffers. But in terms of global visibility value, it is much, much higher. Thank you, UTM International. Um, my big appreciation to my former team at UTM International, the office that I spent for more than six years. Thank you, everyone, uh, from the bottom of my heart. Uh, enough of introduction remarks. Let's proceed with my actual talk today. This is the content of my talk. Um, how I wish I could talk about internationalization, but today we have to talk about pipeline integrity. Uh, the content will be about overview of pipeline engineering, pipeline structural integrity management, and we share about some advancements in pipeline inspection, integrity, and risk-based management. And I will share a little bit more about our research group, RESA, later. We'll start with an overview about pipeline engineering. Pipeline is not something many people normally know or aware of their existence. Although it is one of the most important facilities in oil and gas industry, it is not really seen or visible. Many are installed on the bottom of the sea. Even if they are on land, they are buried underground. So you cannot see them. They are installed for offshore operation. Of course, they are not visible because they are installed 100 meters, even 1,000 meters underwater on the seabed. Even they are operating on shore, they are buried, mainly for protection reasons. The main purpose of pipeline is to transport oil and gas products. It can be in liquid or gas form mainly. This map showing the oil and gas 
map for Malaysia. You can see here that all three developments in the peninsula is in offshore Terengganu and Kelantan. Support and supply base for offshore operations and offshore processing facilities are located mainly in Kerteh and Kemaman area. If you drive pass through the coastal road to Kuala Terengganu from Kuantan, you can see a lot of facilities. All pipelines from offshore Terengganu ended onshore at Kerteh, whereas in Sabah and Sarawak, the main bases are in Miri, Bintulu, Labuan and Kota Kinabalu, or near Kota Kinabalu. Malaysia is actually the world's third largest exporter of LNG or liquefied natural gas after Qatar and Australia and the second largest oil and gas producer in Southeast Asia after Indonesia. And we have one of the most extensive pipeline network in Asia, mainly for gas. Uh, Malaysia's, we also have for oil, but mainly for gas. Malaysia's energy industry is a critical sector of growth for the entire economy and has accounted for nearly 20% of country's total GDP in recent years. It is roughly about 60 billion ringgit. Malaysia's energy strategy is to become a regional oil and natural gas storage, trading and development hub that will attract technical expertise and downstream services that can compete within Asia uh, and, and Asia Pacific. Development of rapid pengerang in, in Johor uh, is part of the overall strategy. We can see the illustration here about uh, it's a typical offshore installation of oil and gas facilities. There are different type of, of offshore structures that use for production. Most facilities in offshore peninsula Malaysia are fixed jacket structures in about 50 to 100 meter water depth. Fixed mean we pile the structure to the sea floor. Floating structures or semi-submissible structures are usually installed in much deeper water. Somewhere in between the water depths between 200 to 1000, it is quite common to use FPSO or floating production storage and offloading vessels. In deeper water, we have TLP, tension lake platforms, semi submissible and FPSO operating together with subsea production system, we call it. Subsea systems are highly complex structures and require high level of engineering expertise to design, manufacture and install this type of structures that operating in 1000 meter water depth. In offshore Sabah, we have many deep water developments. In Kikeh field, for example, we have SPA, this is another floating structure and FPSO operated by Murphy. Uh, the water depth in Kikeh is 1300 meters. Gemusut Kakap, we have semi sub in 1220 meters water depth operated by Shell. And there are other fields in Pisangan, Jangas, Kababangan, Malikai. All of these area are actually in water depths over 1000 meters. As a comparison in terms of height, the height of a Petronas Twin Towers, which is one of the highest building in the world, is 450, 440, uh, 450 meters. And the water depth in KK is three times the height of KLCC. So we're talking about mega structures that we have in Malaysia. What is common to all these facilities is pipelines. So pipelines uh, are the lifeline of, of oil and gas production. Its main function is to transport oil and gas product from one facility to the other especially to transport the product from offshore facilities. It can be 100, 200 kilometers away to onshore facilities. So up to today, pipeline is the most economical means of transportation for oil and gas products, especially gas. Because for liquid, for oil, we have other means of transporting, uh, transporting oil. We have tankers or we have um, uh, uh, tank, uh, ship tankers uh, in the sea and tankers on land. But gas, the only way is to transport using pipelines. So what we have for offshore facilities in Tergano and Kelantan, we can see here that the green spots are actually the, the gas fields and the reds are the uh, fields for oil. 
the country's oil production had experienced overall decline. I'm talking about oil as the result of maturing fields. Many of the oil fields in Malay Basin of Shaw Terengganu are all old. They are more than 30 years. Um, for the past few years, however, we have managed to increase the production when the new deep water development, uh, developments in, in, in offshore Sabah and Sarawak have been completed. Uh, and this is what we what this is what we have in, in, in Sarawak. Most Sarawak offshore pipelines ended in Bintulu, mainly for gas and Miri. Many offshore Miri facilities are all platforms. Uh, we have uh, oil processing uh, facilities in Miri. And pipelines from Kike and offshore Sabah fields go to Kimanis near Kota Kinabalu and as well to Labuan. For onshore pipelines, uh, we have uh, in, in Sabah and Sarawak, we have Sabah Sarawak Integrated Oil and Gas Project uh, installed in 2014. Uh, the length is about 515 kilometer. Onshore Sabah Sarawak, we call it Sabah Sarawak Gas Pipeline, SSGP and can transport gas from Sabah's offshore fields to Petronas LNG complex in Bintulu because in Bintulu we have the plant, the liquefaction uh, plant and for export to other countries. Actually, almost three quarters of oil production in Malaysia comes from Sabah and Sarawak. Only one quarter produced by uh, offshore Terengganu field, in, mainly in Tapis, but many of the fields are already old. Until recently, they have upgraded upgraded some of the fields. So in Sabah and Sarawak, mainly from new development fields in Kike, Gemusuk Kakap, uh, Siakap Petai, Malikai, etc. Uh, pipelines are considered as any operator's goal asset. It is, is it is goal. They, they take care of the assets like goal. Why? Because they are very expensive to build very expensive to maintain in anything goes wrong. If anything goes wrong, it is very, very expensive to repair or replace. There are unseen facilities, but without them, the, the production worth hundreds of millions, if not billions a day of oil and gas transportation will be disrupted. In Peninsula, in Peninsula Malaysia, okay, uh, once the product is transported to onshore, will it will be processed uh, on onshore facilities, either at GPP, gas processing plant, or oil refinery. We have one in Kerti, uh, several in uh, Portison and in Melaka, or liquefied natural gas energy, energy plants. Uh, just to illustrate the, the pipeline network what we have in Peninsula Malaysia, Petronas embarked on, on the Peninsula Gas Utilization, we call it PGU, phase one, uh, project in 1984. Uh, operated by PGB, Petronas Gas Berhad. Phase 2 was started in the early 1990s and involved lying uh, 681 kilometer trans-peninsular Malaysia gas transmission pipeline to link Kerteh with the west coast of Peninsula Malaysia via Segamat. Uh, from Segamat, we have pipelines that go to Pasir Gudang, Johor and Singapore. In fact, we have two pipelines that supply gas to Singapore from Johor Bahru. Phase three extended the gas pipeline uh, trans transmission pipeline northwards along the west coast to Perlis, west coast to Perlis. As demand has outgrown supply in Malaysia, we started importing gas from Indonesia because actually Dai, du, uh, du, Dayong, sorry, Duyong, Duyong field uh, in Terengganu actually is not far from West Natuna B, Indonesia. So we import gas from Natuna, uh, and we also import gas from commercial arrangement area with Vietnam, we call it PM3 CAA. And from joint development area with Thailand, we call it JDA, uh, Joint Development Authority, Malaysia Thailand Joint Development Authority, uh, near Kelantan. So up to the year 2017, PGB operates um, and maintains 2,243 kilometers of gas pipeline across Peninsula Malaysia. So it's a vast network of pipelines that we have in Malaysia. Uh, generally, there are three types of pipelines, what we call gathering pipelines, transmission pipelines, uh, and distribution pipelines. So gathering pipelines are smaller diameter pipelines or flow lines that gather product from satellite platform 
or satellite subsea system to the main processing or export platform. These are smaller diameter uh, pipelines. And then we have distribution lines, which are smaller and lower pressure pipelines that distribute gas for domestic use onshore. These are pipelines in the city or in, cas uh, in consumer area near factory or, or in Putrajaya, for example, or in KL city center. The, the, the bulk of pipelines actually what we call transmission pipeline. So transmission pipelines consist of both higher pressure and larger diameter pipelines to transport gas and or liquid over long distances. For example, that set pipelines that send products from offshore facility to land facility and from land facility to another land facility or from offshore facility to another offshore facility. If it is interfield, if the field is far, uh, because the pipelines that go onshore, we have only a few. We have about our friends from oil and gas can correct me. We, we have six major pipelines connecting offshore Terengganu to Kerti. But there are hundreds of other pipelines offshore. So we have to bring or we have to transport from one field to another and bring the product to the exporting platform and that from that platform we export onshore that can be very very long pipelines 100 200 kilometer pipelines so in engineering everything starts with design uh, we have to have the conceptual design we call it front end engineering design fit this is common terminology that we use in oil and gas and later after we have uh, confirmed the, the the concept the conceptual design, we do the detailed engineering design. So in pipeline design, key aspects such as the site selection, pipeline route survey, local oceanic conditions, design principles, material selection. Material selection is very important. Uh, a lot of factors to, 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 to look at. Wall thickness design, wall, wall thickness based on load and resistance calculation. So this is where the strengths come from, material and thickness, the size of the structure. Special considerations due to location, third party interference, on bottom stability, pipeline protections, for example, coating, sleeper support, etc. All eventually contribute to the life expectancy of the pipeline and what and can affect what kind of inspection and monitoring routines and solutions that can be used in the future. In in the design, um, next. In ensuring the safe and reliable structure, uh, there are many calculations required for every aspect as mentioned uh, in the previous slide. One of them is load and resistance, resist, load and resistance calculations. There are several types of load, functional loads, functional loads, environmental loads, uh, positional loads, environmental loads. For functional loads, for example, functional loads is all the loads that unique to the function of that particular structure for that particular pipeline what kind of product where the pipeline is going to be installed so it's a functional to that particular pipeline so we have to consider weight external hydrostatic pressure internal pressure during normal operation the temperature of content reactions from components reaction from sea floor permanent deformation of supporting structure seabed uh, uh seabed essentially is like what we see um on land there are valleys there are hills there are valleys there are cliff so we have to accommodate the pipelines according to the seascape the, of, of the sea bottom so some area we have to have bridges uh, flyovers we have to design the these supporting structures a permanent deformation due to subsidence of ground due to movable sand for example and loads due to frequent pigging operation. We will mention a lot about pigging operation after this. There are special considerations in pipeline design, which will have direct impact to pipeline structural integrity. Uh, they should be part of the design calculation. A lot of calculation in pipeline design. We have to consider on bottom stability. What we want for pipeline actually is to have our pipeline sit quietly on the seabed. We don't want them to move at all. So calculation of on bottom stability is very important. They have to be heavy enough to sit on the seabed. Free spanning, 
pipe soil interaction, trawling interference, third party loads, drop objects, insulation, vortex induced vibration. Well, vortex induced vibration also very crucial because otherwise they have problem with uh, fatigue. Another important consideration is corrosion protection and weight coating. So corrosion protection is being taken seriously because of the structure usually used uh, for offshore application is carbon steel material. And they are used in high risk area for corrosion attack. So we have to really properly design the correct material and the, the correct protection uh, mechanism. So factors to be considered in, at the design stage will have a direct impact to the ability of the structure to sustain integrity against corrosion deterioration. Remember, if we put our pipelines under the water, we don't want to go there. It's going to be very, very expensive for us to go there just to even to inspect what more to repair. You will see later that one of the common, one of the common uh, causes in pipeline failures is corrosion. So in pipeline design, under corrosion control, we have to look at how to control and prevent corrosion from happening. We have to provide external coating. There will be special riser coating, field joint coating, concrete weight coating. We have concrete, you see in the photos that we have concrete that uh, provide the weight uh, to the pipelines. Remember I mentioned we want our pipeline to be on the seabed, do not move. So we have to we have to put a lot of weight, so we have, but, but we have to design what type of concrete that we put, what type of thickness required to be, uh, to, to have it what we call on bottom stability. But it also we provide cor uh, protection for corrosion. Cathodic protection is very is one of the most important aspect of design to protect our pipelines uh, by using cathodic protection. Manufacturing and installation of anodes that is that's part of, of CP design, as well as design and fabrication of an internal protection system. Once the pipeline is commissioned, commission means we introduce crude or product in the pipeline from the originating station or for example from the producing field or platform and filling the entire length and then start delivering to the receipt system once we have commissioned it we have we still have to expect challenges to the pipeline integrity and what, what we have to make sure is what we call flow assurance some of the startup or pre-commissioning activities can be carried out for new pipelines are what we call pigging for removing debris inside the pipelines, verify ovality and the geometrical shape. So we must make sure that since the pipeline is round, we must make sure that it's completely round. There, there's no deformation because it could happen uh, during the installation, eh? the denting and the ovality issues. Water filling and dewatering after hydro testing and sealing of product or water during commissioning. Once it's fully commissioned and in operation, the pipelines are still continuously subjected to challenges and, and uh, uh, it may lead to failures. Sadly to say there are a lot of pipelines failures happen in the world over the years. It happened several times in Malaysia too. Uh, certainly a lot of incidences happen in crowded production offshore water. For example, in Gulf of Mexico, you can see in the diagram that those red dots are actually uh, offshore pipeline uh, failures or incidences in the Gulf of Mexico, USA. These are some of pipeline incidents worldwide. It happened everywhere that like I mentioned. In 2011, Nigeria pipeline fire kills 100 people and hospitalized 120. In many occasions, it involves loss of life, not to mention cost billions of dollars to bring back the operation to normal. It is happening all the time throughout the world, even in advanced countries like US or Canada. What more in Africa or Asia, uh, even in Malaysia. So the risk is ever high everywhere. In, 19, in 2017, for example, 
in Canada, there were 173 in one year, 173 pipeline incidents across Canada. In the US, 2017, there were 647 pipeline incidents and 37 cases of them, of the cases actually involve death fatalities. Over 20 years in the USA, from year 2000 to 2019, the cost of pipeline incidents have ballooned to 10 billion US dollars. This is the cost of pipeline incidents. So there's an urgent need to address this issue. What caused the pipeline failures in the first place? And if it failed, what are the failure consequences? In most cases, most pipeline failures are caused by corrosion. This is the data uh, from US gas pipeline failure data for two years, for, for 10 years from 2010 to 2019. 80% of the problems are caused by corrosion, human failure, and incorrect operation. Other causes include the effects of material um, failure, excavation, earth movement, natural events like flood, uh, earthquake, lightning, fire and explosion external to the pipeline and vandalism. If you remember the slide I just showed, 100 people died in Nigeria, actually because of, because of the people in that particular village wanted to have a shortcut to oil supply. So they drill hole to the pipelines that are running through their village and that caused big explosion and 100 people died. Vandalism. Main consequences of accidents are fire, definitely explosion and and also release of toxic and hazardous gas so what we do don't want actually is the fatalities extensive damage to facilities and environment and loss of reputation to the company reputation to the company is very important uh, in many cases because once an incident happened the name of the company will be reported in the media and will be not be good for the company to have their facilities uh, uh, being reported like that. So in later we will see in failure consequences, I will share that we analyze uh, reputation loss as part of the consequences of failure. These are some of the examples of the aftermath of uh, pipeline failures. Um, for all you know, <laughs> this, th these are actually photos mostly, mostly from the US, but uh, for you know, there are pipelines just behind your home. In fact, there is one behind my house in Nilai. I, I drive past to Nilai, there, there is a pipeline running through. Um, let's uh, move to the next topic. I'm not sure whether you're following my presentation or not because I, I'm trying to bring down the language such a way that it is um, understandable to lay, lay person, lay, lay man. If you are from the industry, the information that I share probably very basic. Um, and if there is any correction, please let me know. The gist of my presentation is actually how to avoid these failures in pipelines. Oil and gas companies are spending billions of dollars to ensure that the pipelines are safely designed, constructed and operated. Of course, they have to ensure the integrity of pipelines. Um, as uh, well guarded to be safely operated as intended. These are their goal assets. At the same time, it can be their worst nightmares. So that's why we have to have what we call structural integrity assessment. So structural integrity assessment is to ensure that structures are fit to do what they are designed. So this is what we call fit for purpose. In the assessment, we also call fit for service, FFP or FFS, under normal operational conditions and are safe when conditions exceed the original design intent. Sometimes we have to extend the design life of our, of our structure because of the change of function. I mentioned about our uh, oil field in Terengganu in Tapis, more than 30 years, the original design was for 30 years, but somehow we have more oil when they carry out what they call enhanced oil recovery. So we have to extend the supporting facilities like pipeline for another 10 or 20 years more. 
So integrity is just, it's not just a good case of good design. It needs to be maintained so that structures are safe, reliable and perform their design function throughout their lifetime. So this requires a lot of intervention. So the key to the whole concept is to ensure the pipeline integrity ecosystem. What we meant by pipeline integrity is the ability of the pipeline to operate safely and withstand applied loads during its life cycle. It's a big value chain. We will not be able to go through the whole processes uh, today, but we will touch some important points during the rest of my presentation. Some of the key steps here in this diagram are integrity planning, hazard identification, data gathering, data analysis, risk assessment, uh, risk as, uh, integrity assessment, mitigation and prevention and repair, and finally, uh, quality improvement. Uh, everything, the most important, the bottom line is everything should be in a system. For the whole idea is to have a system to address the problems holistically. So there are four main components in conducting PIM or pipeline uh, integrity. Hazard identification, monitoring and assessment, mitigation and prevention, life extension and continu continual uh, uh, evaluation. For hazard identification, this is a process of recognizing and evaluating relevant effects and causes to assess the system to the, in other words, what would be the possible causes that could weaken our structures or cause the structure to fail. So first we need to identify and observe the symptoms or effects. Then we identify the causes of these effects. For example, possible causes could be defects or damage due to accident accidental events or deterioration due to corrosion, erosion and fatigue. Operational and maintenance errors that can be because of human errors. Next step is monitoring and assessment. Uh, monitoring is the process of inquiring additional information to evaluate the potential integrity concerns. So once we have identified the hazards, we need to deploy monitoring and data gathering mechanism to the system. For example, we identified corrosion as one of the hazard to our system, then we have to deploy monitoring of corrosion to the system. So activities such as uh, periodic inspection survey, material property and design records, history, pipeline, inline inspection, corrosion and cathodic protection monitoring. Although we have installed cathodic protection mechanism, we have, but we have to monitor the effectiveness of the system. Defect assessment, repair and strengthening. Probably we realize by now that pipeline integrity is a big subject and we will not be able to explain everything. But I will explain a little bit more about pipeline inline inspection in our session today because uh, it is uh, related to my work. So for, for monitoring and assessment, depend, uh, the challenge for especially subsea pipeline inspection, once the pipeline is in place, is often the water depth. We don't want to go down there. Many excellent inspection uh, technologies, very good technology, cannot be delivered to the pipeline without costly mobilization and equipment. Very expensive and dangerous and high risk procedures and operation, especially when human are involved, diverse. Uh, even we have ROV, it can be very expensive. ROV is a remotely operated vehicle. If the pipeline is multi-layered, we have to strip away the layers and we do want to do it uh, underwater. So the solution is to have inline internal inspection. It is more desirable and cost effective to use inline inspection method to inspect the pipeline without having to stop the operation. So in recent years, many research and development of inspection and monitoring technologies for pipelines aim to overcome these challenges. Depending on the characteristics and location of the structure being examined, uh, the operators can select many measurement methods for determining the conditions of deteriorating pipelines. So these are technologies or basic physics, magnetic flux leakage tools, 
uh, ultrasonic testing tools, geometric tools, hydrostatic testing, uh, inspection using ROV, uh, then we have the visual. So uh, inline inspection, uh, we use what we call peaks. So what is a peak? PIG peak. <laughs> it's a very strange name for people outside uh, pipeline engineering. So peak is a device that moves through the inside of pipeline with the product flow for the purpose of cleaning, dimensioning, sealing, and inspection. I will illustrate the peak inspection operation using a video in a while. Hopefully, our video is okay. Um, these are in this uh, slide, these are very basic peaks. There are two types here I'm showing. One is what you call it cleaning peak, and the other one is gauge peak or caliper peak. They came in various sizes and functionary purposes, depends on the type and of products the pipeline uh, that the pipeline carries. Over time, the I have to check the time when mentioned time. Uh, over time, debris and precipitates like, such as wax and hydrates from the production fluid build up inside the pipeline. The main issue in the operation is that the build up material decreases the cross sectional area and decrease flow rate. And in severe cases, can completely shut off flow when the deposits block the whole cross section. It's like heart attack to our body system when our blood arteries are clogged by cholesterol deposits. So to prevent and to combat such events, inline devices called peak are launched into the into the pipe at high speeds and receive at the other end. So the peak is launched using peak launcher. The peak launcher applies high hydraulic pressures behind the peak, prepare the peak through the pipeline. Such a process we call it pigging. So that's why I mentioned a lot of time pigging. So depend on the length of the pipe of the pipeline from the launching to the receiving facilities, it can be very, very long journey. It can be short, two kilometer, 10 kilometer, but it can be as long as 200 kilometers. So the operators must clean their pipelines on a regular basis. Sometimes in worst cases where they have a lot of wax, they have to do it every other day. So we, they have to check their pipeline clean before they run their intelligent peak. So the dimensional checking is done using gauge peak and caliper peak or electronic geometric peak, EGP, they call it. So what is intelligent peak? Um, this is more advanced peak. Uh, we call it intelligent because it has the capability of detecting and recording data on bands, dense, ovality, band radius, angle and metal loss. You can also identify location and estimate the size of the metal loss. So metal loss detection is the is one of the most important parameters of indication for loss of strength because once we lose the wall due to corrosion and erosion then we lose the strength. So the pipe cannot take the applied load as intended originally. So in terms of technology, there are two major physics principles that use in digging tools. One is what we call ultrasonic, UT. Number two is magnetic flux leakage techniques. So whatever the technique, they have to have basic uh, equipments or tools. They have to have odometer, power pack, next. Uh, they have to have the batteries sensors canisters gps tracking sealing this so they have to have computer on board that store the data from the data when once we receive at the receiver we download the data and we analyze the so i've tried to run the the video here
I'm not sure whether you can see or not. What? What? It worked before this during the rehearsal. <laughs> let me stop the. Let, let me do, do, do again. Sorry. Is it come up? Coming up? Is it coming up? Okay. So you can see here that this is the pig that ready to be inserted into the uh, launching station. So you can see that those are the brushes, the magnetized brushes. So we the, the purpose of uh, MFL technique is we have to magnetize the wall because the flux uh, that induced by the magnetization will detect the defects if you have a metal loss in that part so by controlling the by controlling the pressure and the, the valve the and apply the pressure to the system the pig will flow inside the pipe using the pressure with the products so whether it is gas or oil doesn't matter so we'll move it cannot be too fast cannot be too slow if it is too fast then the system cannot magnetize the wall if it is too slow it might stuck so if the pipe if the pig stuck inside the pipe is going to be big problem for the operators to take them out so the pig will travel from one end to the other while the while the pig is traveling inside the pipe it will collect the data it will collect the the G, the gps or the location they will be able to identify the bands identify the well position identify the cracks and once it's received at the uh, receiving station again we'll do the same uh, we use the valve then once it's out we can download the data to the to our computer and analyze if first we have to analyze the quality of the data if the data is good then fine uh, if we can start uh, send we can start sending it to the headquarters to do analysis if the quality of the data is not good somehow the magnetization was not good whatever we have to rerun the inspection again so this is what we call uh, inline inspection. So that's uh, this is this is um, the current technology. The technology has been around for maybe twenty years, but uh, the industry is keep on improving the accuracy, resolution, and the efficiency of the system. So let's let me go back to. Okay. So this is so once next next once okay in MFL the magnetic sensors uh, are evenly distributed in the circumference and we we identified the the the, the data and then. You can allocate and identify the defects quite accurately, actually, but give but give the data and the percentage of voltiness. For example, if we lose fifty percent of the voltiness, originally it was ten, it become five, so it says you have, you have only fifty percent. So in this diagram, this is a typical reading of um, of the data. If we have uh, two sets of data. If we run two or more sets of inspection over after several years, we could see the differences in terms of the increased number of detected defects and the growth 
of defect depths for the same defects. So this is how we monitor the corrosion growth. There's still a lot of accuracy issues related to the defect detection and sizing until now. Until now, it can be a lot of hot subject, can be a hot subject of, of disputes between operators and inspection vendors. The whole inspection operation is very costly. The technology is quite exclusive to only a handful of players in the world. Um, operators like Petronas, for example, they are looking for alternative technology. If anyone can come up with alternative technology that can compete with MFL technology in digging for part time, it will be great. So next step is mitigation and prevention. I go very quickly because I'm running out of time. Um, the mitigation is the action required to address the integrity concerns. So once we've identified, for example, from the inspection, we see that one particular defect is already 90%. That means only 10% of wall thickness left. What kind of decision that the operator has to make? So whether we're going to, what? We're going to excavate and then we're going to re-inspect or we're going to repair or we're going to replace or whatnot. So that's our decision have to be made and we have to prevent the failures. We have to prevent the failures. So part of the part of the work we have to do after the inspection is we have to reconfirm reconfirm the defect. So this is a flowchart. Another flowchart here can be seen here. Once we have collected it, we analyze it, we see, it, and we have suspicious of any defect. If it is too big, then because we need to make a decision, we need to make a decision what going to do to the defects. So sometimes we have to reconfirm the defects. But reconfirmation of defects can be very costly as the mobilization of equipment uh, resources is very high. But once we have confirmed, then we have to make further decision to leave it or repair or replace. If we require repair, what type of repair or level of repair is required? Defect confirmation inspection uh, can be done through various means. Uh, these are some examples of like special survey being carried out for submarine pipelines using direct uh, direct um, measurement or we have to send the divers down. We can still set the divers down with this, for example, 50 meters, 50 meters, but once it's very deep, then we have to send down the robots or ROVs. It's very expensive. So I think this is a key pain points in, in, in oil and gas industry. They have to make decision all the time. That's why operators will always looking for the best solution, how to make the best decision in part-time uh, integrity. There are a lot of repairs that can be done. Uh, I will skip this one. Uh, life extension, next. Life extension and continual evaluation. This is, this is the process of using the results and, and, and through the assessment, we will come up with integrity management program so that we can extend the life of the of the our structure this i, I mentioned already that in, in in many cases we have to extend beyond the design operational life next skip this so i think we move to the next section of my talk which is uh, advancements in pipeline inspection integrity and risk management um although there are many developments in pipeline integrity technology and approaches uh, we will touch only two aspects of advancement. One is on the technology. Number two is on intelligent and integrated risk-based management system. So on the, let's see the challenges. The challenges, uh, despite our significant advancement in pipeline engineering and technology for repair and maintenance, there are a lot of uh, pain points in, in pipeline integrity. Mainly is due to the environment, subsea, deep water, remote condition, it's challenging internal exposure because the the products that the carry pipeline carry can be high pressure, high temperature. Depends on the flow rate. Sometimes the bench, sometimes the pipe is too small. Sometimes the pipe is too old. There is no uh, there is no facilities for internal inspection. It's costly. I mentioned already. Uh, condition monitoring and repair, underwater repair is still a big issue and costly. Corrosion growth, growth modeling, corrosion growth rates. It's very difficult to model accurately. We are involved, our research group 
involved in in a lot of work uh, modeling corrosion growth in soil in microbial condition uh, in soil particularly there is no model that we can use to see what type of reaction to still uh, carbon steel with with different type of soil in Malaysia, for example. And another issue is data integration analytics. Uh, and in and in, in in industry now they are being, uh, talking this uh, very seriously. Robotic technology due to the challenging environment, especially in deep water, there is no other choice apart from using robotic technology for inspection, monitoring, and repair. Certainly, anything anything beyond 60 meter. Uh, direct role of human divers in repair reduced to zero already. So we have to keep on innovate and come up with different types of uh, robots that can perform different functions. This is uh, one area of research and development that should be leveraged uh, strongly. And second component is is on the technology or uh, detection technology. So to produce more accurate and reliable inspection results and data gathering, a lot of advancement is happening in instrumentation and sensors. Uh, there are some examples, these are some examples of latest development in sensors technology to address the challenges in pipeline integrity. Um, a lot of um, work is being done on the probability of detection and accuracy of detection as well as on sensors technology for, for different types of defects. Previously, MFL can detect quite accurately um, circumferential defects, but having problems of detecting actual defects, actual corrosion uh, um, defects, or even cracks. So cracks also can be very difficult to detect. So now a lot of um, sensors are being developed so that they be able to uh, detect agile defects and, and find cracks. Uh, new sensors that, that use uh, transverse field inspection, for example, and electromagnetic acoustic transducer being developed. Uh, for remote pipelines that are very difficult to assess, uh, they are in, uh, deploying what they call field signature method for monitoring specific sections of pipeline on continuous and real-time basis. So real-time is something big, now we have uh, ability to to store a lot of data and analyze a lot of data. Second component is on on uh, intelligent next uh, intelligent and integrated risk based management system. RBI. So RBI is a tool of inspection planning which provides pipeline operators a method of evaluating the probability of failure and consequences of failure. So there are two components now. When talking about risk, there are two components. Probability of failure, consequences of failure. So higher probability of failure or POF and higher COF or consequences of failure will have the outcomes of higher risk. So all about decision making is now is to bring down the POF, bring down COF so that we have lower risk to our system. So once we have the metric, the risk metric, it's easier for us to make decisions accordingly. So almost across the industry now we're using uh, decision metrics like this. Next, if we carry out pipeline inspection using intelligent pigging, this is sort of data we gather along the pipes. If the condition of the pipe is bad, more data will be detected by the tools. This is the crux of the matter for RBI method. There are a lot of issues in understanding, analyzing the data because of a lot of uncertainties regarding the quality of the data accuracy and operating condition of specific pipelines. So a lot of our research are dealing with, with the uncertainties of the quality of the data. As we have been gathering hundreds of thousands of data, the way forward after this, the best, the best approach is to analyze using probabilistic method and gather all the data uh, using analytic method and use big data to do the whole, um, the whole analysis. RBI next, uh, integration of inspection data analysis and pipeline integrity assessment. In the industry, the standard way of analysis, analysis is what they call deterministic method. But you, deterministic will not be using 
all the collected data by inspection in full. So it's good that we use probabilistic method so that we'll be able to use the collected data more efficiently. If we couple it with proper or, or correct correlation growth model, we'll be able to predict the future integrity. So this is another another area that uh, being done quite a lot in by many researchers. We, based on the historical data, we're able to predict forward what will be the future condition of our pipeline, and we can make decisions based on risk. Another component of risk evaluation is the modeling of failure consequences. If we have a pipeline failure, there are a lot of losses at stake, mainly involve people, asset, production, um, environment, reputation of a company. I mentioned about reputation of the company. Depending on the severity of the incident, it can be very, very bad. Each of these losses need to be analyzed as accurate as possible in order to estimate a better accuracy for overall risk because risk equals to probability of failure multiplied by consequences of failure. So if we have a good estimate of POF and good estimate of consequences of failure, we are able to estimate better risk. So this is the bottom line and the work that we do uh, with uh, our industry partner Petronas. Much of the pipeline integrity management and digital technologies have been evolved to date have been focused on analyzing and managing desperate data sources separately. The future lies in the environment where the data provided at different times. Um, and at different rates are integrated into a common system for data management, integrity evaluation, risk analysis and consequences modeling. As measurement technologies and techniques have improved, we mentioned a lot of work around the area, the ability to measure internal pipe corrosion and erosion directly has also improved, providing a significant, significant new data source for risk modeling. This data allows better management using real data knowledge of the integrity, which can be fed directly into the integrity data management system. So once it is integrated, then we have a better way of managing the whole data. The key takeaway in this chart is integration of the whole value chain from the calculation of probability of failure to the modeling of COF on one single platform. So the whole idea is to integrate the analysis processes, which were done in many companies separately. So if you look at this chart, of course, I will not be able to explain everything, but even from the uh, from data mining, data screening, data alignment, data matching, and then proceed to data analysis, calculation of deterioration rate, on defect, dimension, data correction, uh, parameter parameter modeling using probability distribution and prediction of deterioration distribution based on caution model. Based on that, um, under on, on the same system, we will be able to calculate the remaining pressure or the calculation on the probability of failure using deterministic method and also using probabilistic method. At the same time, we can calculate the consequences of failure and if we have two, these two values, we'll be able to come up with risk metric. So the development of risk metric eventually will help the uh, next, we will help the operator to make decisions. Um, what to ex to inspect, when to inspect, how to inspect, or other actions can take place. So the decision is driven by historical and predicted data, and everything is done on the same platform. So in the future, next, uh, big data and machine learning for predictive pipeline integrity is, is big. Uh, and another component is computer vision. Now there is no algorithm yet to process image uh, so that we can integrate the image into the system and into the inspected, uh, inspection data system. So this is um, is, is also a work in the future. I'm not sure the latest trend currently in, in the industry, but I think many companies are looking, looking into this. 
So raw data, next, raw data must be cleaned, interpreted and analyzed to transform data into information, information to knowledge, ultimately enabling smarter decision making using data analytics. So AI and data analytic based decision making tools are the future trends in the industry as optimization and value for money investment becoming more important. So in summary, um, even with current technology advancement, many more challenges yet to be resolved in parking integrity. But with new innovation in digital transformation and mobile applications, operators will be able to integrate their operation, operational and commercial and management and decision making process into a common platform that offers integrated pipeline integrity management workflows. The greatest value is derived from the ability to simulate thousands and thousands of operational scenarios uh, based on existing history and real-time data with the results used to quickly optimize the daily operational plan and schedule. So what I can summarize the whole my automated talking point is uh, re really the integration of smart sensors, real data, real-time data with um, data analytics combined with integrity prediction using AI-based decision making and if we can come up with autonomous repair using robot, there will be a dream uh, come true to pipeline operators. Okay, before I end my my talk, uh, I would like to just uh, very quickly share about um, our research group, uh, uh, RESA. RESA, we are dealing with pipeline corrosion, offshore structure, recently see structure reliability, wave and ocean thermal pipeline integrity uh, and pipeline repair. Um, we have a good collaboration with Petronas Gas Berhad, PGB, Petronas Research, Petronas Global Technology Solutions, Shell, um, um, Marine, Malaysia Marine Heavy Generating MMHE previously, now we call it MHB. Uh, Run Hill, Wally Parsons, Denberhard, MMC, Olengas, Denberhard, Ash Rosen, Denberhard. So these are our industrial partners. We uh, work closely in various fronts. We already also have one spin-off company that uh, is led by Associate Professor Dr. Khairi, Muhammad Khairi Abu, Abu, Abu Hussein, uh, with uh, many oil and gas clients. Uh, industrial research on integrated pipeline integrity with Petronas. So we have delivered uh, a project completed, integrated fully probabilistic intelligent digging data analysis and risk-based intelligent. So risk-based integrity assessment and prediction of uh, coding pipelines to GTS. Fitted to Petronas technology readiness TRL level four in 2019. So currently the system is being upgraded with other packages that commissioned by Petronas for TRL six for group-wide application. So this currently being uh, under development in uh, Petronas. Last and not least, before I end my talk today, I would like to mention my appreciation again to everyone who have contributed in my life. Uh, special mention is, uh, uh, is to my family members. I come from a big family of 10 brothers and sisters. My parents are still with us and healthy, alhamdulillah. Um, I have uh, seven beautiful children, four already have their own family, and we are blessed with 10 grandchildren, alhamdulillah. Uh, today is the 18th birthday of my youngest daughter, uh, Nawal Iliyin. Uh, she is going to International Islamic University in Malaysia to further her studies uh, very soon. Uh, happy birthday, Iliyin. Uh, today coincide with UTM 100th professorial degree lecture on 6th of August 2020 is also um, this is okay my family family forgot to uh, press the button my family um, good happy birthday and our Iliyin and today is uh, our 33rd wedding anniversary happy anniversary wishes to my lovely wife Azia. I'm so much happy to have you in my life. Thank you for everything. Uh, today is indeed a special day for me, surrounded uh, by my friends and family who continuously support me through thick 
and thing. Thank you for everything. And last, my appreciation to everyone who have uh, made this uh, event success. Of, uh, UTM, UTM Top Management uh, School of Civil Engineering, Faculty of Engineering, Metronas, ACAP, Ministry of Higher Education, and the Office of DVCI. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you so much, uh, Prof. Nurdin. Uh, very interesting topic there uh, related to pipelines. Uh, my background is biomedical engineering. Uh, when you talk about pipelines in civil, what I can relate in biomedical engineering is basically our blood vessels. Yeah, very complicated. You mentioned things like inspection and integrity, uh, management of pipelines. So similar to blood vessels, we also have inspection of blood vessels and integrity of our blood vessels. So definitely interesting topic. Uh, so um, in order to uh, handle the Q&A session, uh, we will invite Prof. Azlan again. Uh, hang on a minute. Where is Prof. Azlan? Oh, Prof. Azlan is here. Hang on. Okay. All right. Thank you, uh, Dato. Rafiq, and of course, thank you so much to uh, Prof. Nordin for a very enlightening uh, lecture for almost one hour. Um, we'll be um, receiving um, written questions to the uh, chat or FB. Meanwhile, while waiting for that, let me uh, give a short commentary on what has been uh, uh, shared by Prof. Nordin. There are three main parts of the lecture coverage by Prof. Nordin just now. The first part is on uh, introducing the subject on pipeline engineering, where Bronadin had shared information on what constitute pipeline engineering projects, uh, sharing with her the data on Malaysia's uh, oil and gas pipeline infrastructure network, so extensive, and in facilities. Uh, he also uh, uh, gave an informative discussion on pipeline design criteria and also installation process and methods to uh, uh, indicate to us the complexity involved in those uh, processes. And in that part also, uh, Prof. Nordin showed some oil and gas pipeline failures and incidents uh, to indicate to us that despite the serious attention given to the safety of oil and gas pipelines, failures and, and accidents do happen. And of course, the industry is continuously learning from this uh, failures to keep improving this industry. The second part, which uh, was uh, uh, deliberated by Prof. Nordin, uh, was uh, related to pipeline structural integrity management. So from introduction, slowly and surely going into a more serious uh, subject, um, where uh, Prof. Nordin uh, explained to us what it is and what it, why it is important, this uh, structural integrity management. And uh, he gave more detailed discussion on the PIM or the Pipeline Integrity Management System where uh, Prof. Nordin deliberated in more detail the four main components or processes in conduct conducting the PIM, namely the hazard identification, monitoring and assessment, mitigation and prevention, and life extension and continual evaluation. That was quite a uh, detailed deliberation on each of those four components. The final part is uh, was the the third one was uh, regarding the recent developments. This is the the crux of the uh, uh, the topic uh, which was uh, which is presented today by Prof. Nordin, uh, where uh, Prof. Nordin has shared with us the advancements in this pipeline inspection, integrity, and risk management. Uh, he gave a detailed discussion and deliberation on most recent technologies and approaches in two key areas. The first is about the uh, regarding defect and damage inspection technology. Uh, the, the, the key ones are actually a metal loss and crack inspection, which are quite critical for, for a pipeline and mapping technology. The second area of uh, uh, deliberation was uh, on the advancement in intelligent and integrated risk-based management systems. So in some total of all these, uh, I can uh, try to summarize uh, three key points from the, the, the one uh, from this uh, professorial lecture. 
The first point is uh, despite serious focus on safety, there is uh, still heightened public concern on the uh, safety, right? Particularly to two areas. Number one, the pipeline integrity vis-a-vis -vis safety and secondly, the environmental impacts of pipeline transportation. Hence, uh, we can see uh, there are also increased regulatory focus by many countries and government to make sure this pipeline industry is uh, managed and uh, in a in safely manner. The second key point is the effectiveness of pipeline integrity management programs. Yeah, despite uh, the application and all the existing existing management by various industries, there are still issues on how effective these uh, integrity management programs are, uh, and particularly there is there was a, the need for integrated approach using modern measurement technologies and digital management system. And the last key point is uh, on future outlook, where uh, Prof Nordin had uh, very extensively shared with us the use of uh, real-time measurement technologies, the current uh, methods of management, uh, ma uh, maintenance, and moving, to moving towards integrated and real-time decision-making system uh, required to enhance the long-term reliability of the oil and gas pipeline network. So that is my uh, brief commentary. And of course, we uh, also would like to congratulate Prof. Nordin for very uh, good uh, deliberation as well. As Uh, questions, written question, if there is any that we can uh, uh, pass to Prof. Nordin to answer. All right, there's a, uh, there is a first question there from uh, Prof. Hamdan, I, I, I presume, uh, asking whether uh, are there any loss of gas and oil due to pipelines, probably due to pipeline leakage. Yes, problem again? Okay, okay. Um, one of the key issues in pipeline integrity is to make sure there's no leakage. So, of course, a lot of instrumentation are being devised to, to check the leakages. Um, if they have a monitoring system instrumentation to, to, to check the pressure drop or whatnot. If we have, for example, the um, uh, corrosion defects, uh, and in many cases, um, in many cases can be very severe and a lot of defects. In fact, there's one particular pipeline, they have thousands of holes on the pipelines because somehow the products that being transported by this particular pipeline uh, is very corrosive to the pipeline material and it was undetected for for some time i mean quite a quite long time and because of that the the corrosion accelerate and 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 cause the pipeline to have a lot of perforations if you have a lot of holes a lot of perforations to the to the pipes then you lose you lose a lot of products so in this case gas so they lose a lot of gas uh, and there is no sign i mean so if, if we carry gas and we carry crude oil if crude oil if there, uh, there are leakages there will be um signs i mean there'll be a pollution to the area but gas you cannot detect so these are issues but there has been cases in remote area in big countries or vast countries like in the US or Canada, it's quite common that they lose some of the material, some of the products. In Malaysia, it is more controllable because although we have a um, big network of pipelines uh, running throughout the uh, country in Peninsula Malaysia, for example, but we are small and it's, uh, it's much easier to, to monitor the integrity of our pipelines. Okay, thank you. 
Can we have the second question? All right. What parameters are essential for designing pipeline, especially hard and remote area of oil and gas exploration in any country? You got that question, Ron Madri? Okay. I think the um, for designing purposes, uh, it depends on the there, there sev depends on several factors. Number one is the product the product that they're carrying, what kind of product requirements, uh, whether it is gas or oil. So gas or oil doesn't matter anywhere, it doesn't make any difference. It depends on, of course, it can be different because of the type of product. It, it can be, it can be, we call it sour product or sweet product. This is the terminology that we use in oil and gas. Um, sour products will contain a lot of hydrogen sulfate and because of that, we have to provide suitable material that can sustain uh, that type of uh, content and what type of loading we're talking about so in any structure for that matter we have to know what type of loading we have to do the analysis so loading in the case of pipelines is the pressure the higher the pressure then the stronger the pipeline the pressure we're talking about for pipeline is very 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 high very very high we're talking about one it can be between 200 psi to 1500 psi or it can be as 60 times uh 60 bar i mean 60 times the atmospheric uh pressure so it is it is very very high pressure uh, when you have very high pressure you remember we have you have to push the product very long long distance we talking about 100 kilometer 150 kilometers and the liquid for example the crude oil is very uh, very dense the the that and we have to apply very high pressure in order to move the product from one place to another and the the pressure is very high so in design i mentioned about load uh, and resistance the loading uh, itself is internal pressure and if it is installed in in the sea then it depends on the depth if we install in very deep sea there will be very high external pressure at the same time if we install it onshore then we have we, we don't have external pressure except that we bury it so the loading will be on the, only the cover so for internal, the, the, there will be products and pressure. Externally, there will be external environment. So external environment, either in the water, so in the water or in the soil. Sometimes in big countries, like if you, uh, in countries like in the US or in Canada, in Alaska, for example, you will be exposed to extreme cold, extremely cold weather. So we have to take care of external exposure it can be extreme cold it can be in the desert extreme hot so external environment has to be considered in the design so we have to provide sufficient insulation uh, to cater uh, the temperature differences sometimes okay the product can be sensitive to temperature uh, for example if it is high temperature product uh, it, if it drops slightly, the temperature drop, it will change the constituents, it become waxy, like what Prof. Um, Rafiq mentioned, the artery will become blocked because of the originally crude have changed, become wax because of drop of temperature. So in pipeline design, we monitor the temperature drop from one end to the other. So if the product is so sensitive to temperature drop so we have to provide the insulation to the uh, pipeline so these are considerations in the design which um, eventually will contribute to the efficiency of the pipelines so irrespective of the region so region uh, or, or, or countries or environment exposure exposure like coal countries we have to be very very careful careful about the material we use the steel material. Steel material used in extremely cold environment uh, can be susceptible to 
cracks easily because of very cold environment. So you have to choose the material according to the specification or and, and also exposure of environment. I think uh, that, I mean, it's very difficult to explain what the design uh, as a whole, but roughly tackling uh, the, the the issues there, I think if hopefully Mr. Muhammad Anwar Hussein satisfied with my answer. Okay, thank you. I think uh, Pranodin had uh, mentioned in one of his slides the nine criteria for pipeline design. So while this criteria, um, nine criteria apply, uh, can be applied to any uh, country in the world, but there are so there are certain specifics uh, 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 to these certain countries, especially for functional load, like uh, explained by Pornodin, like external pressure, temperature, yeah, and environmental loads may differ from region to region. Right. So uh, thank you. Um, can we have a next uh, question from Ahmad Khairi? Uh, from Ahmad Khairi. Yeah? Uh, what do you think of digital twin technology in the assessment of onshore and offshore assets, including pipeline integrity and service life? Silakan. Uh, probably I do not understand what does it mean by digi uh, digital twin. I read something about it, but I cannot relate it uh, in order to answer this question. Um, uh, I'm sorry, Prof. I, 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 the twin I, I, I probably I need more explanation about this twin Probably I've. Okay. Uh, Never mind. I, can, I, I cannot answer that question because I cannot ask, I don't understand okay. it. We move to the next question from Prof. Zin. One of the biggest losses in water pipeline is due to NRW, non revenue water. Some studies estimate NRW of more than 30%. NRW in Malaysia may exceed this. What is the global average like in ONG pipeline losses? If the pipeline loss is a lot lower, could we extend the protection measures from ONG to NRW? Okay, NRW uniquely for water because in oil and gas there is no practically no uh, losses because of of um, for for pipe, water pipelines the. Losses actually due to failures of pipelines, and since the risk of failures for water pipelines is not as high as for oil and gas pipelines, the water authority do not really put extra effort in ensuring their pipelines are reliable. So a lot of losses are due to pipeline failures, but in 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 um, in in oil and gas, we cannot afford to have failures in valves or failures in any component of of pipelines. So losses that we are referring to is 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 uh, totally different. I meant losses when I answered the first question. It's because of there have been cases of because of perforation of walls, which is very very rare, because the inspection will detect it right away. Uh, and uh, the, the cases where ex, uh, accelerated metal loss happen in one or two years is very, very rare indeed. Uh, the corrosion growth usually will happen over many, many years. And we cannot afford to, to have leaks uh, in, pipe, uh, uh, in pipelines at all, actually. Although there are leaks, but I think, I don't think I have, I don't have the data. I don't think that that will that will that that is allowable in the first place anyway. I may be wrong there because I don't have data. But generally, we cannot we cannot accept uh, and our what 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 we call NRW uh, in water pipelines for oil and gas pipelines. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, do we have uh, any more question? Yes, one from Adnan Hassan. Eh? On average, how long is useful life for oil and gas pipeline. Is there any redundancy being used in design to prolong the pipeline reliability? Okay, the design life again, it depends on the code of practice and the company specification. Most of the design, we will have, uh, for example, if we, if we design the, 
the pipeline for all specific all per operator, for example, Petronas, or we design it for companies like Shell. So we usually follow uh, the standard issued by the company. So Petronas, they have what we call PTS, Petronas Technical Standard. In Shell, they have uh, Shell Generic Standard. So we follow the, um, the, the specification given out by the company who own the pipeline. At the same time, at the same time, we have international codes like ISO or American code. Other international codes are being used as, as, as uh, guiding principles. We we have to follow certain things, but uh, we have to follow what is required by the client. And the client will specify what sort of requirement for their pipelines. So useful life, we depends on what type of uh, size the reservoir of the oil or gas we're talking about. Some reservoir can be very big, so it will, it will last very long. Some reservoirs are very small, and they require this for a very short while. Even for infrastructure, other infrastructures like uh, oil platforms, um, fixed oil platform like we usually see with a jacket platform with a fixed pile, that type of structure we design for big reservoir where we can leave the structure for a very long time. There are the types of infrastructure we use for small field. Uh, we call it marginal field. They can probably last five years, for example. So we just use temporary structure like jack ups or we use FPSO that can be used there and then we can because uh, FPSO basically a ship. So if we undo the anchorage, we can bring the ship to somewhere else uh, to, to be reused. So the size of the field is very important. If the field is very big, it can last very long. Okay, General, generally I can answer this question like this. So these are specific requirements. Some are small fields, some are big fields. So the, the, the duration of the pipe uh, it depends on the life of, of the service life required. So we can design accordingly. But usually we expect the pipeline to last at least 25 years. 25 years. So 25 years uh, of, of, of service life. Uh, if that, of course, usually we have redundancy of certain places. It depends on the code again, what type of margin or safety or type of safety that is being put in the code. So to me, it's safe, even we design for 35 years, if everything is being taken care of. Maintenance is very important. Again, they have to monitor the effectiveness. 25 years, if we design for 35 years, we still have to make sure that whatever protection that we design for is working. For example, corrosion protection system. Corrosion protection system, the most common we use cathodic protection. So cathodic protection also we design for 35 years if this is structured for 35 years then we have to monitor whether the cathodic protection system is doing what they are supposed to be doing, uh, protecting the, st the, the structure. And there are ways of uh, monitoring it. And also other means of protection like coating uh, and also uh, the, 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 man the regular maintenance like cleaning. So usually whatever we design, it comes together with the protection and we must make sure that the protection doing what's supposed to be doing. Otherwise, the structure will not last long. Again, I, I, I go back to my example that I gave for Tapis. So Tapis offshore Trangano is oil plant, oil field, originally developed by ESO a long time ago in the 70s, 80s. So it has been there for a very long time. Uh, after the contract finish, actually the contract the PSC, we call it the production sharing contract between ESO and Petronas last third. The brand is finished, then the, all the facilities were transferred back to Petronas. And Petronas, when they receive the infrastructure from ESO or from the PSC partners, they have to evaluate whether the structure, or number one, we have to evaluate whether they have sufficient revenue, uh, sufficient product still to be extracted. If they still have, then for how long? How much more left and then if the estimate is going to be 
now it's already 35 years, for example. It's, the structure was designed for 35 years. But suddenly, when they, re, when they uh, reassess the field, the reservoir, they still have another 20 years. <laughs> so the, the, the structure already lasts. I mean, it's perfectly OK, maybe 25 years. But can the structure last another 20 years or what? If they want to, the structure to be uh, still okay for another 20 years, then they have to do a lot of other things. So they have to do the assessment, retrofitting, they have to repair, they have to upgrade structure as well as other supporting facilities like pipelines. So it's very interesting discussion there. Thank you, Prof. Adenan, for uh, the question. Okay. Thank you, Pranodin. Thank you, everyone. I think that was the last question that we can entertain today. I'm sure there are many more questions, but we have limited time to entertain everyone. Thank you for those asking questions. And of course, congratulations to Pranodin for a successful professorial lecture. It was very enlightening, one hour lecture. And uh, perhaps uh, I would also like to congratulate RESA Research Group for uh, uh, many accolades of achievement and recognition, industrial partnership and collaboration that have, they have done, all of which is testimony to the usefulness of the research work done by this group and practical application of research outcome produced by this group. And of course, Prof. Nordin was the first founder and head of this research uh, group, RESA. Yeah? So um, uh, thank you again and congratulations everyone, Prof. Nordin and the team and uh, uh, we end this with Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. Uh, I pass over back to Dr. Rafiq. Uh, thank you, uh, Prof. Uh, Azlan. Uh, thank you also, uh, Prof. Nurdin. Uh, you know, uh, when you discuss about these pipelines, I always uh, try to relate, you know, how I can benefit those technologies that you have for pipelines. Uh, for biomedical applications. So if we can somehow miniaturize, you know, all the technologies that they have in oil and gas pipelines to be used in our blood vessels, that would be great. I guess that is uh, my next research topic. Uh, so again, thank you very much, Prof. Nurdin Yahya. Congratulations uh, to, to you. Uh, thank you to Prof. Azlan uh, for moderating the, uh, the, the session. And then uh, I must also thank you to the team at the Faculty of Engineering for making this a success event. And uh, to all of you watching this uh, UTM professorial inaugural lecture, uh, thank you for watching. Uh, and uh, until next time, bye for now. Bye bye, everybody. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum.